Got you. Plug the brand. Plug the brand. Do what you got to do. I sat through you a lob. All you had to do was finish it. Oh, God. It's so great. Zach How you doing? Yes. Blake Baker, Bo Davis, Kevin Peoples, um, Corey Raymond, and Jake Olson. Let's talk about the staff. Zach, I said this earlier. I don't know how much you agree on it or disagree. I, I, I think that this is just so much more or so much better than what they did under the first defensive coaching hires under Brian Kelly. Am I crazy to think that this staff, like, hey, here we go. Okay, we got a staff in here now. I don't think that's crazy at all. I think anybody who's looking at this new staff, I think you look at it as a home run. I mean, he knocked it out of the park with just about every single one, to be honest with you. I know there's going to be some people who sit back and, and look at that Corey Raymond hire and think, okay, well, he hasn't done well the last, let's say, three, four, five years. But at the end of the day, I think there's a lot of room for him to grow. And the, the recruiting landscape is a big part of this as well. And he's obviously fantastic at that. So I, I think it's an absolute home run. Blake Baker's fantastic. He's bringing his people over with him. No pun intended. Uh, I got your beach to it. Uh, you know, he's got Kevin Peoples. He's got Jake Olson. He, he, brought the, he brought the team with him. And then you add somebody like Corey Raymond in the mix, too. And it, it's, it's, a, it's a home run, man. He, he assembled an all-star staff. And I, I can't really find too many complaints. Matt Zenitz reported first today on this. Uh, but something that kind of already been brewing uh, in Baton Rouge I put this on our, our website, uh, uh, Zach, a couple of days ago that I just something that I had been hearing in reference to like, hey, man, Jake Olson, like, turned some eyes like Brian Kelly was like, oh, God, damn. oh, like, oh, damn. Yeah. OK, like, no wonder why you're bringing him here. And then they give him an on field role. Surprised that Jake Olson is the safeties coach with because a lot of not it's not the sexy hire. It's not the big time hire. But now you got stuff coming out of Ops like, hey, man, this guy blew us away. Kind of sounds a little bit like Brady. I'm not going to go there. But the last time we heard something like that, that's what we heard it about. No, I think the points that you're bringing up are pretty valid. And I, I've heard people talk about Jake Olson as this kind of, you know, obviously up and coming type of guy, football genius. I, I've heard a lot of different things when it comes to Olson. So, you know, to bring him on staff is fantastic. And to put him in an on field role is, is even better. So I, I think it's the type of, situation where look Blake Baker is a guy who is very good with safeties he's obviously good with linebackers too he's kind of a jack of all trades but when, when you have somebody like Blake Baker who's so you know well-rounded and has this ability to coach safeties he's going to be right there he's, he's going to be his right-hand man with Jake Olson so if he you know gets into a rut or he's unsure with a couple of things he's Blake Baker to rely on so I think it's not necessarily you're putting him in a position to learn but you know every day is going to be a learning experience for him as he's transitioning to an on-the-field role so no I'm not surprised I'm Heard really good things about Jake Olson, and I think I think he's going to do a really good job with these safeties. Worried about him in recruiting? I'm not. I, I think you have a staff that is so just unbelievable on the recruiting trail right now. All he's going to do is soak up you know information like a sponge. Because like I said, you got Corey Raymond who's going to be dominating when it comes to recruiting defensive backs, and Blake Baker, you know, and then you got even other guys like you know this guy named Bo Davis who's pretty good at recruiting. I know he's going to be doing a specialty with you know the defensive line, but all star staff, elite recruiters, and all Jake Olson can do is sit back and, you know, absorb all the information he can. All right. To bring the elephant in the room, some a little bit pun intended. They still need some help along that defensive line, though. Like, okay, so you knocked it out of the park on the hires. I can't argue to you on that. Like, I mean, it is strong what they've done. Man, I'm worried about them at defensive line. I I'm really worried. I don't think you're wrong. Obviously, like coaching can only go so far and your defensive line depth is abysmal. I mean, you don't have anybody really there. You have three, four, five bodies. So, you know, you're over the scholarship count right now. You're sitting at 88 scholarships. You need to get down to 85. And I think that second transfer portal window in the spring is going to be your bread and butter. I, I think that's what, where you're going to, you know, have some people leave, free up some space. And then with that space, you're going to go out and add some defensive line bodies. So that that's going to be where you go add a couple of different guys. And I was talking to some people and it's a situation where you have to go get at least two or three more people and, you know, they, they have to be established. So look, I, I think that second transfer portal window is going to be your bread and butter where you go and add, you know, a couple different guys to add some depth and, you know, some starting talent as well. What position group do you think that it gets processed from? Because I don't know. Oh, okay. It, go ahead. Sorry. It, it's, it's an interesting, it, that's really interesting to me just because I think the, the spring, the spring, you know, spring ball in general, it is really going to be where you see the depth chart be created and you're going to see guys either fly to the top or fly to the bottom. And those guys that fly to the bottom in this new transfer portal era leave. 
whether it's at cornerback, whether it's at line, but whatever, whatever you think it is, you're going to see some people leave, whether it's receiver, because you have so many weapons offensively. Now, I, I think you're going to see a couple of different spots open up, and that, that's where Brian Kelly and Bo Davis and the staff are going to have to go attack the defensive line group and really add a couple of guys because it's super important. You know, something I hadn't talked about, too. You do like, dude, I hadn't talked about Josh Williams returning at all. Like everything that they're doing on offense, I, I Zach, I, I'm just kind of like, okay, I, not questioning you, not going to do it. I, I mean, like, until you start showing me that you can't do it and you can't get better and you can't develop, yeah, I, I'm just not going to question. I just don't know of the offensive pieces that they process. I, I think it's got to be dudes on the defense, right? I mean, look, you have 20 safeties and corners, 20. Like, that is a lot of bodies out of 85. I, I mean, I, I'm not saying to do it, but, look, only five of them are going to play. And then you're three deep there, okay? And quite honestly, the way, depending on how they play Harold Perkins, it's really just four DBs if he's going to continue to play in the slot like that. So I, I start questioning where this is going to add uh, uh, come. Now, let me – it's Ju it's July or August. You they don't have to get there until August, right? To to right. get under the limit. Mm -hmm. Correct. But I mean, I I think you know once that portal window opens up right off the bat, I think you're going to see a lot of guys enter. Uh, just because, like you said, people are going to get processed. People are going to look at the situation that they're in and also say, "I got to get the hell out of here because I'm not going to play." Um, and I think you right. have a very good point when you talk about the secondary as a whole. I mean, 20 guys is a lot, and only a handful can play at one time. So I think you're going to see a lot of people you know, within the secondary leave. I think you'll see a couple, a couple other different position groups depart as well, but it's going to be that secondary where you see a lot of guys bounce. I I, I really do think so too. Uh, Zach, anything else on the defensive of staff hires? I, I know you mentioned Corey earlier. Um, look, I think Corey can do a lot of great things here. I, I think a lot of people have mistaken what I've said over the last 48 hours in reference to, look, man, he had a lot of success here, but – if I look at 2019 to 2023, he's 97th. His unit is 97th in passing yards allowed. It's not as if he didn't recruit really well at both spots. So I start asking myself, like, hey, okay, it, it, I know what I can get. I, I know what the creme de la creme is. I also know what the, the very bottom of it is. Is there a reason for concern or not maybe concern, not being a good word? Is there re is there something that we need to see first before we say, hey, man, DBU really is back? Absolutely. I think the proof's going to have to be in the product, and you're going to have to – you can't just say that just because Corey Raymond's back on the staff that DBU's back. You don't necessarily have the personnel just yet to, to dominate. I think you're, you're going to have to see some player development be created. I think you're going to have to see some more youngsters make an immediate impact, and – I think it's all going to really come down to guys like Ashton Stamps, J.B. and Tobiano, Jeremiah Hughes. Um, the jump that they make this offseason is going to tell a lot for me just because they've gotten that SEC experience underneath their belt. I, I think the world of J.B. and Tobiano, I think the world of Ashton Stamps. And obviously you look at a guy like Tobiano, and he's played a lot of different positions already. And I, I think you're going to see a lot happen this offseason with those guys once Stamps is fully recovered from that surgery. So to kind of get back to your question, no, just because he's here doesn't mean DBU's back. It's going to be the player development aspect of it all, and once you get the once you get those guys on the field and you're in a real in-game situation, that's going to be when we're going to kind of tell like, is Corey Raymond back? Can can he do this for us? And that's going to be the telling sign for me. Do you think all of the shift now goes to if they promote Sloan and Cortez? I, I mean, Sloan's out there recruiting. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, what message are you sending? If Like, if he's not going to be your OC, or, or at least the one calling plays, why are you sending him to a guy that's a five-star and the Harper kid? Why are you sending him to a guy? Look, because I've just – look, so, hot sources. I put this on our, our message board. James Simon's the next – they're trying to get – you know, James Simon, like, you can just – like, it's not even – well, how about this? It's not even sourcing. They're putting it on social media. Like, the, that is their next target. So, am I – like, it's got to be Sloan and, and Cortez here, right, a, a, as a promotion? Yeah, I, I 100 I, – I would say that. I, I would say so myself. And kind of looking at James Simon, obviously, that's the next big fish that you're trying to land. And I had the chance to talk to Harlan Barry, and he's excited about having a one-two punch of him and James Simon as well. So, yeah, to put him on the recruiting trail and get in front of these guys, obviously, it's his region. 
you know, being down here in Louisiana and stuff like this is this is right. his bread and butter. But yeah, to, to kind of just simplify and, and be short with your question, yeah, absolutely. I think you you go in and you elevate somebody like Joe Sloan and work from there. I think you see that happen sooner rather than later. Now that you have all these defensive hires kind of in the rearview mirror, you, you've got it done. You've got your on-field staff done. So now you, you, you go fast forward, put your foot on the gas, and get this offensive coordinator situation locked and loaded. If it's Joe Sloan, let's get it. If it's Cortez Hankton, let's do it. And whatever you got to do, it, it's going to be an in-house hire, in my opinion. So it's kind of just a matter of time. Tommy Rees, not being retained at Alabama, your thoughts? It's interesting. I was asked about that the other day. And, you know, he, he's talented and he's young and he does good things. Um, I don't think it's a situation where LSU looks to go and try to bake, break the bank on somebody like Tommy Reese. I, I think, you know, Brian Kelly tried to bring him over once. It, it didn't go as planned. And now I think you have a good thing going with this offense, with this staff and with what you got. So I think you you go in-house. Um, but when it comes just to Tommy Reese alone, I don't think it's surprising that, you know, that Alabama didn't keep him because he brought his offensive coordinator, who's fantastic. So I wouldn't say I'm surprised. Think that there's any possibility that he comes here on a analyst type of role? No, I think I'd see him as a. I think he's going to get a, another job sooner rather than later as a as an offensive coordinator. That's just my personal opinion. I couldn't see him, you know, taking you know moving a step down and becoming an analyst. No, I couldn't see that. All right, very quickly on this because look, I got absolutely abused on this question or or thought. So last night I talked mm -hmm. about. Look, Bruce Feldman is Bruce Feldman. He is a national reporter. He has sh clearly shown that he had, like, he's broken LSU stories before. He's a national guy. I mean, he breaks a lot of stories. Okay. All that being said, he comes out with Brian Kelly, okay, being on the list for Michigan, even though I don't think it's happening. Just stay with me. And people are like, Blake, stop talking about it. Well, I mean, Bruce Feldman's putting in an article, okay? What were your thoughts when you when that came out? Because I thought this had kind of died down, and then here we go again. I think you and I are on the same page. I'm not gonna, uh, I'm not gonna be all dramatic and stuff because if it was just you and me, I'd probably be saying a couple of different things. But man, I'm so sick of this whole Michigan Brian Kelly saga. It's like I'm gonna keep it PG, but it's just like zip it. You know, I'll keep it. I'll keep it quiet. Um, it's like, what are we doing? Uh, what's the point in continuing this this clickbait headline BS? Obviously, he's here. He wouldn't have just hired a not just a home run defensive staff if he was leaving. Um, and you know, obviously, he said that this is his final stop on the on the Brian Kelly caravan or whatever it was. And you kind of have to say that. But uh, you know, I don't think Brian Kelly is going to Michigan. I think a lot of people within this space believe he's not going to Michigan. And you know, if Feldman wants to go and put that out, he can go and put that out there. But you know, I think people within the know don't think he's going there. LSU has an interesting chance here, obviously, with Grimesley going into the portal and Trey Amos going into the portal. Um, thoughts on LSU trying to add guys in the portal here, maybe in the recent future? I, I think the Trey Amos situation is pretty unique. Obviously, he's going to visit Ole Miss and there's kind of like rumblings that he could potentially pop when he's on that Ole Miss visit. I, I think if you can get him on campus here in Baton Rouge, that would be fantastic. I think you need to continue to push for that. But when I it comes to the whole landscape of the of the transfer portal, look, there, there are position groups of need. And there's reasons why Trey Amos is a guy who's been linked to LSU. There's reasons why Grimesley has been linked to LSU. It's because you need to get some more established guys on uh, in your secondary. And I know Grimesley isn't one of those guys, but the upside is there for him. So – yeah, I think you're going to continue to see LSU be in the in the in the talks with you know defensive linemen, secondary guys, and you know continue to work to do that as well as get underneath the scholarship count. Haven't talked to you since. Uh, is this the first time we've had you on, on the, in the new year? I think so. Oh well, welcome back. Um, thoughts on Nick Saban retiring? Look, I know we're all LSU guys over here, but Nick Saban is an absolute legend. He he's the greatest of all time, in my opinion, in my young life. Um, so I think he's an absolute legend, and obviously, it, it's 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 insane to me to know that whenever LSU suits up and, and goes and plays against Alabama, that Nick Saban won't be on the sideline. To me, that's pretty pretty wild because my entire life, all I've done is seen you know Nick Saban dominate the game. So to see him you know hang up hang it up and and go and kind of 
transition to the next part of his life, even though he's 72 years old, it's, it's pretty unique. So I hope him and Miss Terry can kind of get after it and have some fun and go on some trips and spend some more time together. Cause you know, obviously he's worked like a mule for the last, you know, five, six decades. So it, it, a legend it is my opinion, but look now uh, it opens up a whole different dimension for LSU to continue to take that next step and dominate some more recruiting, dominate the SEC and, and continue to take steps in the right direction. Are you surprised at the fallout with the players at Bama right now? I, let me say this. Let me. I, I'm surprised because, Zach, it's not like Saban's not in that building. He literally got an office in the building. And yet players are gone left and right. I mean, why isn't he fighting to keep guys here? Like, why, I mean, I, I, I'm thinking to myself, like, Hey, man, I, I mean, you don't want Bama to succeed? It's certainly a mass exodus. Is mass. The best way. Like, that's the best way I could put it. And look, you've seen a lot of these guys come out and say that they wanted to play for Nick Saban. Like, that was what they wanted to do. They wanted to play for Nick Saban, and now they don't necessarily get the opportunity to learn to, to play for him. They get the opportunity to learn from him, of course, because he's going to be in the building. But they don't get the opportunity to play for him. So, obviously, that's going to be a pretty big topic of conversation here. And I think – you know, the new head coach is going to have some, not necessarily trouble, but I think it's going to be a tough adjustment getting to recruiting in the SEC just because it's a whole different ball game down here. So I, I, I think I'm not surprised. I don't think anything. I, I, I'm not surprised in general. I think I would have assumed to see a lot of these guys depart. Men's basketball, 3-1 and one in conference. What do you think? Proud of Jordan Wright. Jordan Wright came back to Baton Rouge. You know, he, he wanted to do this. He wanted to put on for the city, and, and he's doing just that. He, he's been the heartbeat of this team, and – He's a locker. He's a guy in the locker room who everybody kind of like just gravitates towards. So to see him have that game that he did last night was fantastic, and that stat line is unbelievable to me. Like he he absolutely he balled, and now you can see a backcourt of Jalen Cook, Jordan Wright for the rest of the season. And you know I think towards you know the back end of SEC play, it's a somewhat challenging schedule, but th this team is trending in the right direction, and McMahon's kind of steering the ship in the right direction. So I'm really happy with what they're doing, and I'm a big fan of Matt McMahon. I've had the chance to talk to him on several occasions, and. He's a fantastic guy, and I want to see you know him. I just want to see him win. I want to see him succeed, and th this is what he's been wanting. This is what he's been waiting for, and I think he's trending in the right direction now. I'm happy for Matt because I think he took a lot of unfair criticism. Like, mm -hmm. for me, for me, this is technically his year one. Yeah, we talked we, – yeah, we said that last time. Absolutely. Yeah. He, was, he was putting in just an uh, impossible right. situation. And I think that we got a little bit too excited when they beat Arkansas at home. Like, oh, shit. Like, mm -hmm. how is he doing this? They're 3-1. and one. They have more wins now than they did all year last year in the conference. So I I'm really happy for, for Matt McMahon. Uh, before we let you go, because LSU uh, tips off at 8, um, think they bounce back tonight? I think they do. I, I think this team's going to be fired up to do something special. Um, the, the simple answer is yes. I, I think they're going to come out firing, and I, I think you're going to see Kim Mulkey a lot of fire under these girls and uh, get the dub. I, I, I got to keep a PG over here. So I, I think they're going to light a fire under them and, and pull it out. I don't think that you're going to see back-to-back -back losses from this team this season ever. So bounce back in Tuscaloosa and get it done. Zach Nagy, Sports Illustrated, LSU Country. Thank you, bud.